It's March 7th, 321, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The first recorded use of the word weekend in the Oxford English Dictionary was in 1879, which really highlights the fact that having more than a single day off per week is actually a fairly modern innovation. And in fact, throughout much of the history of the civilised world, you got one day off per week. And for most of the Western world, that day has long been Sunday, thanks to the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, who decreed it thus on this day all the way back in the year 321. Yeah, unless you were a farmer, because the actual text of the edict that he released on this day was on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and the people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agricultural work may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits. So he's consecrating this day to Christian devotion up to a point, you know, you still don't want the harvest to suffer. Yeah, which sounds like he'd thought through some implications there, doesn't it? He goes on. Uh, It often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such (laughs) operations the bounty of heaven should be lost. But the elephant in the room there isn't what about the vine planters, it was what about the Saturday Sabbath then, mate? You know, the one that the Pope in Rome practices based on what it says in the Bible? (laughs) It's quite weird (laughs) that he didn't address that departure from Judeo-Christian thought but did talk about what you should do if you're grain sowing. The evidence we have suggests that until the 4th century, so the 300s, many Christians were still observing both the Jewish Sabbath and Sunday. So they had the full Friday evening right through to Saturday evening, and then they went straight into Christian Sabbath. You can't have Friday night dinner and a Sunday roast. That's just too much. (laughs) But the reason Constantine chose Sunday to be the day of Christian worship is that it already enjoyed this special status in the Roman week. And Sunday then was named after the pagan sun god Invictus and it would become the day when wages were traditionally paid to workers which uh, led to the day being uh, established in at least Roman minds as a day of celebration and thanks Uh, and it sort of corresponded enough with the Christian Sabbath uh, you know in that it was only one day out or so Uh, and so he was his hope totally spinning for Constantine now Aaron (laughs) but it's true he he was really hoping that it isn't true you might say it's pragmatic (laughs) but it's not what the whole Judeo-Christian world did at this point. God had only (laughs) written directly to humans once using the method of carved stone tablets and it was fairly clear to Moses, wasn't it? Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, six days you'll do labour and all your work, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, I'm God, do it. And it was in every possible (laughs) reading of the calendar, the seventh day was the Saturday. Constantine just, as you said, it's more convenient for me. It's a bit difficult that I've discovered Christianity and I've got a lot of pagans amongst my empire, so I'm just going to pretend it's the same thing and say it's the same day. (laughs) It is pitting himself against what God said, if you're a Christian at this point. I mean, this does actually bring us to the origins of the week itself. And unlike years or even kind of broadly months, the seven-day week has no astronomical basis. And the week's origins are, as you say, kind of associated with ancient Jews. But even like the evidence takes it further back than that, that the Jews borrowed the idea of a seven day week from Mesopotamia, particularly the Sumerians and Babylonians, who divided the days of the week into seven. And they named them actually the names that the Romans then used after the uh, planetary bodies that they knew about, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, as well as the sun and the moon. And for centuries, actually, the Romans used a period of eight days in civil practice. But by this stage, a lot of people were practicing this seven day week in line with the sort of Judeo Christian uh, development that had started to take hold by this stage. Yeah, so at this point, Days of the Week was still a relatively new innovation, which maybe makes sense as to why it was pretty easy to sort of mix them up a little bit and decide which day you wanted to be your Sabbath. For the majority of the empire's existence, Romans referred to dates by their place in the month. So if you think of the Ides of March, that, for instance, is one of them, rather than being individual repeating, you know, days in a cycle within the month. And so this seven-day week came into Rome through Greece, which in itself had taken it from the Babylonians, and they gave the names of these so-called classical plans which are the seven ones that you can see with your naked eye. You know, we're in the time before telescopes. And the earliest evidence we have for the new system is graffiti in Pompeii, which refers to uh, the 6th of February, the year 60 AD, as being a Sunday, Dias Solis, 
But it wasn't until closer to where we are now, the kind of the 200s and then the, in the early 300s, that the seven day system had completely displaced the earlier systems that Rome was using. And this was all part of Constantine's drive to streamline Roman society around these new Christian concepts. Well, also, maybe he was still hedging his bets. So Christianity had come to Constantine in a dream. He said that Jesus had visited him in a dream, said, carry the emblem of the cross with you and you'll win this battle you're fighting. And guess what he did? So he was then pretty keen on Christ Mm. and went about building lots of churches and presiding over the council who decided that Jesus was a divine being and signing off freedom of religion uh, across the Roman Empire. Well, freedom to be pagan, classicist or Christian, not Jewish. Jews killed Jesus. But... You know, he was paving the way for saying one day we're going to be properly Christian. But at this stage, I mean, this is only, I think, five years after he's put on the Arch of Constantine in Rome images of Sol, the sun god. Mm. So it's it's like marrying those two things together, putting Jesus's day as the sun god's day is kind of like, we'll do both for now. Let's do both. Well, Constantine himself was a bit of an enigma, and early Christian writers kind of portrayed him as this wise and benevolent ruler. But there was then a backlash against that in the early modern era when Constantine was depicted more as this kind of vicious, backstabbing political opportunist who slaughtered allies and family alike. And there's a bit of both in him, truth be told. But his embrace of Christianity was definitely a power play and quite literally, you know, he had this dream, he marched under the banner of Christ, he defeated his imperial opponents to become emperor of the whole of Rome. And so, as you say, Ollie, it was part of the sort of mythos that he created around himself, and also the practical way that he had taken power as well. Yeah, and you touched on the sun god element. I think because when you think Christians in Rome, you think, being eaten by lions. It's kind of hard to imagine how a Roman emperor could publicly embrace Christianity and not meet with any backlash. But if you look at it in the context of, you know, in the Roman era, you had these individual cults that rose up around different gods and they would be sometimes gods from completely different cultures that would be brought into Rome and adopted and they'd have their own temples and their own priests. So Christianity to begin with from the perspective of a Roman probably didn't look all that different to those past cults and you can certainly see how for an emperor the idea of pushing society towards this monotheistic religion that had this one powerful figure at the centre of it is actually probably pretty convenient if you're trying to model Mm. the empire in that image yourself with you as at the centre. And of course, he carried on down this path. Four years later, he abolished Passover, uh, even though Jesus had been quite keen on that one as well. That's what he was doing at the Last Supper. Um, That was old Jesus. This is new Jesus. (laughs) Sunday Jesus hates Passover. Um, uh, But he didn't go fully fledged Christian, actually, i.e. get baptised until his deathbed. He rose from his deathbed, Mm. coughing and spluttering to go and get baptised. Which is also a good time to do it in a way, because it's it's at that point you say, I'm not going to sin again after this, isn't it? And he had about an hour left to live. Yeah, that was apparently his rationale, is that he thought this was like a clever trick to make sure that his soul wouldn't be tainted (laughs) with sin. So that was 25 years after he converted to Christianity, was when he finally took the plunge, as it were. But he did, he sat sat on the fence in a lot of ways that I find incredibly entertaining, because he he issued all of these decrees based on his newfound Christianity. They all start off, it's like something from a sitcom, they all the first half sounds very humane and then the second half you're like oh so he banned crucifixion good and replaced it with hanging bad he <laughs> banned forcing prisoners to become gladiators and fight to the death oh that's, that's nice good yeah but he replaced it with forced labor in mines oh yes, I see. Mm. Uh, and my favorite one he banned face branding hey cool and he replaced it with foot branding right i see <laughs> tomorrow He chases teenage girls with his trousers down, blowing a horn, and he plays the harp. (laughs) Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.